Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Jordan, for inviting me um, to do a naloxone training with you all today. My name is Hillary. I use the pronouns she and her. And I'm here in my role at main access points. Um, feel free, like Jordan said, to put questions in the chat box. I do my very best to keep an eye on it throughout the training, but I will definitely get them to the end. Um, for individuals who are looking to get access to naloxone following the training, you can feel free to reach out to the number on the screen. I will also put it in the chat box um, and I can say it out loud right now. It is 207-319-8823. And you can call, text or signal um, that phone. For folks who may be watching this webinar on YouTube, you also can utilize <laughs> that number to reach out to MAP for naloxone um, following your viewing of the training. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, just a little bit about main access points. Our mission is to recognize the resiliency of people who use drugs and to work in collaboration to create access points for overdose prevention and harm reduction services in Maine. And we do that through our overdose education and naloxone distribution program, as well as our syringe access programs in Sanford, Maine and in Callis and Machias, Maine. Um, we also have a mail delivery program where folks can access naloxone while we have an executive order <laughs> through the state um, in response to COVID. We have aftercare and support, which is really informal peer support surrounding grief and loss, um, experiences of overdose. And, um, and then we do some organizing and advocacy work as well. I was telling Jordan that if my, um, if I freeze, if my internet gets weird on us, I will come back. And if I go away, I'll come back. Um, but someone let me know if I have frozen so that I can kind of start over with where you left off. Um, so I like to start trainings by sharing these words from our friends and teacher, board member, mentor, <laughs> Eliza Wheeler, um, because I think that they really help situate um, the conversation, this training for us, and help helps to provide an understanding of how we approached this education. So I'll go ahead and read this. When we think of overdose prevention, of reviving people with naloxone, we do not think of it as a simple public health intervention. We think of it as an act of restoring life, of air, of breath, of allowing for the energy in a human being to begin moving again, to be reanimated. The concrete life-saving act of administering naloxone and restoring breath is also a symbolic act of friendship, of connection, and of a radical refusal to allow someone to die alone of a preventable death. The act of restoring life to a friend, a family member, a stranger, this has deep ripples outward, re-envisioning the way we treat each other and the ways in which we see each other and value the lives of people who use drugs. And so in sharing these words, I just like to recognize that depending on our own lived experiences, sometimes things can come up for us in these trainings. Um, and if you find yourself in the situation where things are coming up and you need to step out, that's okay. Um, if you would rather connect one-on-one -on -one or in, you know, individually at another time, you can reach out and I'm happy to provide that space. Um, if you need to go deeper into conversation, you can reach out to me after the training or to another support um, through your organization. So just let me know um, if there are ways that MAP can show up to you in this education and you know, in our relationship afterward. So we'll go ahead and get started. 
we like to start these trainings by explaining what's happening physiologically when someone's experiencing an opioid overdose, and that's really respiratory failure. So an opioid overdose occurs uh, because opioids are attracted to the brain receptor that's in charge of breathing. So when there's too much of an opioid on that brain receptor, it's going to slow or stop someone's breathing. Um, and that's, you know, and that's respiratory failure. Naloxone works because it has a higher affinity to that brain receptor than the opioid does. So the opioids on that brain receptor, someone's experiencing an overdose, we give them naloxone, it bumps the opioid off, it sits on that brain receptor, and the naloxone blocks the opioid from being able to get there, which allows someone's body to start, you know, breathing again, to be responsive again. Opioids include this, you know, long list of medication, hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, codeine, fentanyl, heroin, Dilaudid, Opana, Demerol, Tramadol, methadone, and buprenorphine. And so naloxone, also known as Narcan, blocks that brain receptor and is known as an opioid antagonist, right? So it's, it, it's used to counter the effects of the opioid overdose. Um, naloxone is only going to work on opioids. It's not gonna work on other drugs. So it's not gonna work on a stimulant like methamphetamines or Coke. Um, and it's not going to work on another depressant like a benzodiazepine, so like Xanax or Clonopin. It only works to reverse the overdose of an opioid but it's also not going to cause harm if you give it to someone and they aren't experiencing an, over, an opioid overdose. And that's really important, right? There's very little risk in giving someone naloxone and that's why our programs can exist, right? We train lay folks to save each other's lives with this medication and we can do that because it's really safe. Um, naloxone is non-scheduled, it's a prescription medication. So you can access this naloxone behind the counter at a pharmacy. So you don't have to have a prescription in Maine. You can access it through a standing order at the pharmacy. Um, we prescribe the naloxone that we distribute to folks. Um, and we do that through our own standing order. So when you receive education from us and receive naloxone, both the vial and the syringes used in the intramuscular preparation, as well as the nasal, are prescribed to you. And then depending on the preparation, naloxone can be injected into the muscle or sprayed into the nose. There are four types, four preparations of naloxone. We primarily give out D, which is vial and syringe, um, the intramuscular preparation, but we also have a small supply of A, which is the one-step nasal. We don't see a lot of B, which is a multi-step nasal, or C, which is the auto-injector around these days. Um, but it's important to note that not one of these preparations works better than the other. It's really about what you're comfortable with and what's available. We're talking about risk factors. Um, we'll go over five together. So what puts someone at a higher risk of experiencing an opioid overdose? Um, so first up, mixing multiple substances. So anytime someone's using more than one substance, they're at a higher risk for experiencing an overdose because it's stress on the body, right? It doesn't matter if you're using two depressants or a depressant and a stimulant. A depressant and a stimulant, they aren't like balancing each other out in the system. It's just causing stress. And so certainly there are high risk combinations. So an example would be a opioid and another depressant or another pill like a benzodiazepine. But also, you know, there is risk in mixing methamphetamines and an opioid. And so really, you know, safety can look at using one drug at a time, not mixing um, high risk combinations and just knowing your body, knowing what works. Tolerance. So anytime someone has a low tolerance, they're at a higher risk for overdose. And someone can experience a low tolerance when they've never used before or when they've decreased or stopped use. And that just means their system isn't used to that substance. 
And so someone who is leaving the hospital or detox or has been in a time of recovery, they're releasing from incarceration, all times when someone's at a higher risk for overdose. And so certainly using less when your tolerance is low, right? Doing a tester shot, understanding the supply, understanding how it you know, is working in relationship with your body and knowing that you can always use more, but you can't take it out, right? Quality, um, you know, we have a really unpredictable supply of drugs in Maine and that um, has only increased with COVID. Um, certainly how folks are able to access their drugs have changed um, and, and that unpredictability um, is really present. And we've seen a lot of, um, you know, a large increase in overdose and overdose death um, in the past in the past year. Um, and so when we think about unpredictability and what safety can look like, it's really about kind of having that communication and community knowledge sharing, um, having a consistent and reliable supplier of your drugs. Um, so, you know, someone that will let you know when a supply has changed, when there is increased risk. Um, we also can look to models for safe supply, um, policy change for um, decriminalization or, um, or other means of safety through, through policy and law change. There is a really good training through the Harm Reduction Coalition on, and it's free, on safe supply models um, that exist in other parts of the world, and I definitely suggest checking it out. And then risk factors, the other two. So using alone or health. Um, so anytime someone is alone, they're at a higher risk of dying from an overdose because there isn't someone there to respond. And so the messaging is always don't use alone, right? Use with someone else, stagger your use so that any given time someone can respond to the overdose. That's also, you know, we think it's really important to to consider like what does safety look like when we are alone, right? People use alone for a lot of different reasons, choice or lack of choice. And so what does safety look like in that situation? And sometimes it's as simple as leaving the door unlocked so someone can reach you um, or calling a friend. So maybe there isn't someone that can be there in person, but there's someone that can be on the phone that you can come up with a safety plan with let them know where you are and that if you are unresponsive that they can call 911 for you. We also know that there are some hotlines um, that are popping up that essentially act as that friend, right, that come up with a safety plan and respond to an emergency. And then the last one is health. So, you know, anytime part of our system, part of our body is working hard or compromised, it's going to increase the risk of overdose. And so if someone has a compromised immune system, active infection, lacking sleep, dehydration, malnourished, um, these are all times when someone's body is working really hard and at a higher risk. Um, like to focus on folks who have compromised respiratory systems. So someone who has asthma or COPD or symptoms related to COVID. Someone whose respiratory system is already compromised is going to baseline be at a higher risk for overdose because an opioid overdose is respiratory in nature, respiratory failure. So I see there are some questions that have come into the chat box. I'll pause for a minute, look through them and see if I can address any right now. Sure. Um, so how is it legal to prescribe medication to folks? <laughs> so we have a, um, a standing order signed by a nurse practitioner um, who prescribes the medication through the community distribution laws in Maine. And so Maine has specific laws that allow community partners, community organizations to utilize a standing order, the same tool that a pharmacy uses to distribute naloxone to the community. So there are specific laws in Maine for community distribution of naloxone. Yeah, 
And I'm definitely going to go over how to how to administer both the nasal Narcan as well as the intramuscular um, naloxone. Sure. And you know the question is, do we have access to both nasal and intramuscular? And we do. Um, we primarily give out the intramuscular, um, but we do have a small supply of the nasal Narcan for folks who are uncomfortable with that. Um, you know, I always like to remind folks that if you want a little more training after to really explore the IM, if you have questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in this setting, we can definitely set up a one-on-one -on -one training to go over it more. But if you just know, like, I am not able to use that, we respect autonomy and choice. We want to get the <laughs> preparation that works best for you. And so you can reach out and we can get that. And those are the questions we have for now. So we'll keep moving through. So just a little fentanyl specific messaging. So, you know, since there has been an increase of fentanyl in the drug supply in Maine, we've certainly experienced um, a lot of overdoses, a lot of grief and loss. And with that, you know, fear. At the same time, there's been a lot of misinformation. And so together, there is just like hysteria surrounding fentanyl. And we want to be really clear about what risks are there and what risks aren't there. So the little myth busting. Um, first off, it's just really important to know that you are not at risk of overdose by touching someone who is overdosing or by touching fentanyl. Fentanyl powder is not absorbed through the skin. It's not a fentanyl patch. It's just not the preparation of the medication. And so sometimes people are told that if they, you know, if they come across someone who's experiencing a fentanyl overdose, they're at risk of overdose by responding. We want to be really clear that that's not the case, that it's safe to respond to someone. Similarly, there can be fear of a contaminated air supply and that causing someone to experience an overdose. So if someone is using fentanyl in a room and they overdose and you enter that room, you are not at risk. It would take an incredible amount of fentanyl being pumped into the air supply for there to be a risk of overdose. And so it's safe to respond to someone again. And then finally, sometimes folks are told that fentanyl is naloxone resistant, and that's not true. So naloxone works as an opioid antagonist on all opioids. So there are definitely times when someone will die from an overdose, but it isn't because naloxone is, uh, or that fentanyl is naloxone resistant. There are other factors that come into play in those moments. And so if we think that someone may be experiencing an opioid overdose on fentanyl, we want to give them naloxone and we want to go through the response plan that I'll train you on. So moving into signs and symptoms of an opioid overdose. Someone is unresponsive to outside stimulus. They may be awake, but unable to talk. Their breathing is affected. It's really slow, shallow, erratic, or has just completely stopped. Their body is limp. Eventually respiratory failure leads to cardiac arrest. And so sometimes someone's pulse may be affected. You know, we can experience someone, I think I just froze for a second. We can experience someone to have um, pale or clammy skin tone. There can be blue on their lips or on their fingertips underneath their fingernails. And sometimes we experience someone to make a choking or gurgling sound, and that's really the sound of respiratory failure. So while all of these signs and symptoms can present in an opioid overdose, sometimes they don't all present, right? And we don't want to wait for them all to present for us to respond. And so in our response plan that we train folks on, we really focus on that first sign and symptom responsiveness. So our steps that I'll train you on, checking for responsiveness, 
calling 911, providing rescue, providing rescue breathing, and administering naloxone. So this first step, checking for responsiveness. When we're talking about responsiveness, we're really talking about a meaningful communication that someone is okay, that they are not overdosing. And so we check for that by first using our voice, hey, are you okay? Hey, I'm gonna Narcan you. If someone's unresponsive to voice, we'll go ahead and do a sternum rub, which you can see an image of on your screen. But really you're taking your fist, your knuckles and rubbing up and down on someone's sternum. It's a wicked tender part of the body and it is going to, um, it's gonna get a response from someone who is able to respond. And so just to be clear, responsiveness is not a grunt. It's not a moan or like a shifting of the body. It's really clear communication that we're looking for in utilizing um, these steps. If someone's responsive, then we want to stick with them. We want to make sure that they're okay. We don't want to leave them because someone can move into an overdose. But if someone is unresponsive, not communicating to us, then we're going to move on to the next step. And that next step is calling 911. So it's really important for us to recognize the complexity of this step and to recognize that in our community, there's a lot of fear of contacting 911 during an overdose. And that fear stems from people's experiences of criminalization. Um, and while we have good Samaritan laws, sorry, my dog. While we have good Samaritan laws in Maine, um, that's only, I can tell you this has not happened very often. Um, excuse my, my pup Watson. Um, so <laughs> while we have good Samaritan laws in Maine um, and they protect some folks from criminalization at the scene of an overdose, we know that people's experiences still actualize in a lot of fear surrounding this. And so we like to break these steps down. We like to be clear about what this communication can look like um, and how we can move through this call. So most importantly, we are giving the location and the phone number of the overdose. And then we can give a picture of what's happening. So my partner's unresponsive, my friend is not breathing. If we have fear of using the term overdose or letting someone know that this is a drug related emergency, we don't have to use that language. We can just be clear about what's happening. Regardless, if we provide them and continue communicating with dispatch, they're still gonna send someone. We want to be as communicative as possible, but they're gonna ask a lot of questions because they're trying to help us figure out the next best step in this emergency. And it can be really hard to answer all of their questions and address the overdose. So if you aren't able to do that, just be clear with dispatch, let them know, I can't answer all your questions right now. I'm responding to this emergency, but it's safe for EMS to enter making sure the door is unlocked so that they can get into the building is also important. Um, and we really talk about trusting your response, right? My hope is that when you leave this training, you know the steps and you have the knowledge. If things get confusing though, certainly communicate with them. Let them know that you need their support. If you have your phone on speaker, that can be helpful because you can communicate with them. And then and that's these moments to be able to move through the steps. So we've identified that someone's unresponsive. We've called 911. And now we're going to set someone up for rescue breathing. So we teach people rescue breathing because this is a respiratory emergency. Rescue breathing is a really important tool in our response. We can keep someone's body oxygenated a really long time, like hours, right? By breathing for them. And that's specifically helpful for folks who are, you know, living in isolated areas of the state 
where maybe EMS response time is really slow. We can continue breathing for someone, keep their body oxygenated while we're waiting for the naloxone to work and while we're waiting for EMS to arrive. Rescue breathing is really safe. There is very little risk of transmission of bloodborne illness through this um, tool. We can have use a CPR mask as a barrier um, if we feel com if you feel more comfortable with that, and we have those that we can distribute. Right now, however, it's a pandemic, and there is risk of transmission of COVID through rescue breathing. And so we wanna be really clear about that. For some folks, that risk is going to mean that that's not something that they can provide right now. And if that's the situation that you're in, that's okay. Calling 911, giving naloxone is a great step, right? That's really important. For other folks, they will find comfort in using a mask, their own mask, as well as a CPR mask and giving rescue breaths. And that's really about the autonomy and choice of the person that's responding. So there is no wrong decision in this. It's really what's safe for you. And that's important. So when we are starting the process of providing rescue breathing, we're ideally getting someone onto the ground lying down. We want to tip their chin back to open up the airway. And that looks like this. So a lot of times, right, one of those signs and symptoms was that someone's body's limp, right? So their head may be kind of tucked down. We are going to take their chin and open up that airway. We're then going to pinch their nose with our fingertips and make a seal of our mouth to theirs with a barrier if we decide that's safe. We will start by giving two normal size breaths. These two breaths are used to kind of jumpstart the system. We will administer naloxone and then we'll go back to rescue breathing after. These breaths are normal size breaths. They are not hurricane breaths. They're not super fast. We're breathing for ourselves and we're breathing for them. So we've given those two breaths. And now we are going to administer the naloxone. So I am going to stop sharing this so that I'm big for a second and then I will reshare. <laughs> I'm pinned, right, Jordan? Cool, great. So one vial of naloxone is one dose measured to one milliliter. So it is not filled to the top and it's not supposed to be. There are two doses, two vials and two syringes in each of our kits. Each vial has an orange cap on it. It's a seal. We are going to flick that cap off with our thumb so that this dark gray circle is exposed. That's rubber and we can puncture through that with a syringe. Helpful to note, so every vial has a label and a window. If you face that window towards you, you can see where the tip of the syringe is. And our goal is that the tip of the syringe is always submerged in the naloxone. So if the tip of the syringe is way up here, we are just drawing up air. So we want it right above that metal rim so that the tip is always submerged so that we're drying up naloxone when we're, when we're drying up. We draw up the medication by pulling back on the plunger until the naloxone makes its way from the vial into the barrel. If there's a little bit of naloxone left in the bottom of this vial, we're not gonna worry about it. We're just getting out as much as we can. If there's some air in this syringe, we are going to push the air out by pushing in on the plunger until a little naloxone comes out the top. That was a lot of naloxone. <laughs> until a little naloxone comes out the top. We are then ready to administer. So I'm gonna share the screen again. Okay, 
So you can see on the screen that there are four red circles on a figure. Those are the ideal places where we are going to administer the naloxone. So into a big muscle, into the thigh or the upper arm. We administer at a 90 degree angle into a big muscle. And we're gonna use some force, right? Like we are going through clothing, we are going through skin and we wanna get into the muscle. So we're not worried about going like too deep in this moment. Really, we wanna just make sure that we're administering into their muscle. Once we have put the syringe into their muscle, we are going to push in on the plunger and the naloxone will make its way from the barrel into their body. So this syringe is an intramuscular tended to get into their muscle. This is gonna go through genes. This is gonna go through Carhartts. It is not gonna go through thermals, Carhartts and snow pants. So if someone has a lot of layers on, we want to either expose the site or find a different site for injection. So for the nasal preparation, the nasal comes in a box that looks like this. Hey, Hillary. Yes. Hi. Um, did you say how deep into the like into the skin, into the muscle we are trying to go as far as like inches, maybe or centimeters? I don't know. Yeah. So this is, you know, I think I try to give um, a kind of like a vague response to this, honestly, because in the moment, it's going to be really hard to think of how many inches or how deep we go. And so what my response to that is really you are using pressure to make sure that you get it all the way in. So you're looking to go deeper rather than shallower. Um, and so it takes pressure and the pressure that it takes um, doesn't really allow us to like measure how deep it goes. And I know that that's a hard response. Um, when we're trying to imagine this scenario, but I think it's actually a useful response for when you're in it, which is I am jabbing this into them. I am using force and I am making sure that I get into their muscle rather than um, just barely into their skin. And I'm happy to talk about that a little bit more. Okay, thanks for the thumbs up. <laughs> so, in each box of the nasal, there are two preparations of uh, Narcan. We are going to pull back on the tab where it says pull here. We are going to pull this back and then we can take out the Narcan and we have this. Once this is out of the package, it's ready to use. There's no um, cap or anything. So we take the nozzle, put it up their nostril and push in on the. Again, one of these is one dose. If we're giving two doses, we're gonna switch nostrils. And just to note, this isn't, um, this doesn't require someone to be like inhaling it, right? Because we can assume that they are not breathing. Um, this works like a flow nase. It sprays up into their nostril, into their nasal cavity, makes its way through the mucous membranes to the brain receptor where it will have its intended effect. So regardless if we are giving the nasal or the intramuscular preparation, we are going to wait three, two to three minutes between doses. And we wait two to three minutes between doses because it just takes time for this medication to work. If we were to give one dose or three doses in that first two to three minutes, it's not gonna work faster. And ideally we are giving the least amount of naloxone for someone to be responsive. So we wait two to three minutes between doses. And while we are waiting, we continue with rescue breathing. One breath every five seconds. So breath, one 1,000. Five seconds for two to three minutes. At the point of which we've hit that two to three minutes, we can give the second dose of naloxone. And we can continue in the 
It says my internet is unstable. Can you all see me okay? Thumbs up, great. So we can give one breath every five seconds in between two to three minutes. At that two to three minute mark, we will give another dose. And we can continue to give as many doses in that pattern as necessary or until EMS arrives. At the point of which you're giving the second dose of naloxone, if you have not called 911, it's important to call because we just aren't sure what's happening at that point. Maybe they're experiencing an overdose on a different type of drug and so naloxone isn't gonna work and we would want someone there. So we've identified that, yeah. Hi. Um, you're saying if we haven't called 911 and a reason that we would not call 911 is if we were afraid about drug charges? Yeah, so I mean, there are a lot of different reasons why someone would experience a barrier in calling 911. We know that people save each other's lives with naloxone all the time and don't call. Um, we also know that people call, right? And so if someone hasn't called 911 um, and doesn't feel safe to do that, we really suggest at the point at which you're giving that second dose, we want to make that decision to call because we don't know what's happening. So we're taking like a harm reduction approach to this conversation. So what's the next best thing we can do? what is safety for each individual and how do we make decisions based on that? Okay, thanks. Hillary, we so, have a couple other questions in the chat, which maybe one of them, I think one of them is, they're actually both really applicable right now. Maybe you wanna wait till the end to get to them, but. No, that's okay, thank you. Throw it in. Sure, okay. So wondering about, um, legal protections for individuals who administer Narcan to someone. So we have two types of Good Samaritan laws in Maine. One is based on criminalization of individuals who are at the scene of an overdose in regards to possession of paraphernalia or drugs. The other Good Samaritan law we have in Maine is general medical Good Samaritan laws which means that if you are a lay person and you find someone who is experiencing a heart attack on the side of the road and you do your best to respond to that heart attack and they still die, you are not liable. Overdoses are included in that general Good Samaritan medical laws. So if you are responding to someone in it who is experiencing an overdose, you give them naloxone, and that person, you know, still dies from the overdose, um, or it's a different sort of emergency, and you gave naloxone because you were making that assessment, you are not liable. There is safety in that because you are a lay person um, responding to the situation. So there are legal protections in the state of Maine in regards to us um, responding. Yeah, and then there's this concept of consent, right? Um, and I, you know, my, how I approach this, and, you know, I have responded to overdoses and I've never had consent in giving someone naloxone, um, is that if I don't give them naloxone, they're going to die. And so that's, you know, I work with that reality in a couple different ways. Um, so one is I am always really present to folks after I've given them naloxone, you know, whether it's in a workplace or a friend. Um, part of that also in my response, when I am responding to someone, I talk to them and I do that for a couple different reasons. So this person is unresponsive. And so I you know, I communicate what I'm doing. So, hey, I'm, you know, I'm gonna give you a dose of Narcan. I've called 911, rescue breathing, I'm talking to them, I'm providing that communication because in my experience, people can kind of come in and out of responsiveness, right? So we've given them naloxone, we're waiting for them to become responsive. 
And that isn't like Pulp Fiction 90% of the time, right? Like people are not like wide awake. They are kind of throughout that process when I'm doing A, it keeps me on track, but also I think that it's important to communicate when we're doing something to someone's body. And that's kind of part of my respect for consent and managing the lack of consent. With that being said, there are very chaotic overdoses and that sort of communication is not possible. And then my decision is really based on this idea that if I don't give them naloxone, they are going to die. And so I am going to give naloxone and I am going to be very present to the aftermath of that because people want us to give them naloxone if they're overdosing. I think that that's like really generally how I approach that situation. Sure, and so then someone talked about in you know, this idea of like, consent, giving naloxone, but also consent in calling 911. And I think that that's a, uh, a really meaningful conversation. And, and I think that there isn't an easy answer, right? We are doing our best in this moment to respond in the most respectful, um, and dignified way, right? And so if someone, if, if what I need in my response is to have 911 there, I'm gonna call 911 and then I am going to, again, provide whatever protection I can as an individual to the person that's experiencing that overdose. So sometimes, that can be if they're, you know, maybe they respond, everything's okay, I cancel the call. Maybe EMS shows up and the person says, I don't want to go to the hospital. And I'm really clear in their right not to have to go to the hospital, that I'm going to be there with them, right? That I'm going to stick with them for 60 to 90 minutes because that's part of our aftercare plan, right? Being with someone for 60 to 90 minutes after we've given them naloxone because naloxone wears off between 30 and 45 minutes. And during that time or at another time, I'm having a conversation with them about why I called 911 and what they would like me to do in the future. And how do we come to some sort of agreement on both of our needs in that moment and what's safest for us collectively and individually. And so this aftercare part, because this is an emergency, because someone is, you know, really like dying, we take a lot of care. Um, the Harm Reduction Coalition recently shared this idea of this aftercare as being a welcoming back. I found that very powerful um, and really reflective of my experiences in responding to these emergencies. I think Hillary's going to join us in just a sec. She mentioned GA was having internet problems um, at the start of this. And so if she happened to get gets kicked out, I think she'll be right back and join us. Um, I'm going to keep the recording going and just mute myself again. Um, but I think that she's probably going to jump right back in if I had to guess. So it's like, I'm back. we're good. All right. Hi. <laughs> I can tell you it's never happened that fast before. Don't worry about um, everybody. So we're good. Great. Thank you. Um, so that, excuse me while I get to that last slide. I don't need it. That aftercare is really about having the conversation, holding the complexity of not having consent, of managing through 
you know, someone's own rights, their own fear, their own grief, um, and reminding them that, you know, that they're uncomfortable, you know, that they may be uncomfortable, that naloxone, you know, is putting them in withdrawal symptoms for that 30 to 45 minutes while the naloxone is there. If they are trying to ease those withdrawal symptoms by using, it's not going to work. It's bouncing off, but it's still building up so that they're at risk of overdose when the naloxone wears off and that opioid can reattach. So really that aftercare I think is a really meaningful time that can hold kind of the hard moments in these overdoses. Um, but also knowing that sometimes, you know, we say wait 60 to 90 minutes with someone, but they wanna leave, they, you know, you can leave. We have choice. And so what does safety look like in that situation? And, and just showing up to someone's whole person um, and, and figuring out what care looks like in these moments. Just a little bit about storage of naloxone. Um, you can't see your, your PowerPoint right now, just check. That's okay, it's it's over. Okay. And so I thought I would just talk, that's Got okay. Um, <laughs> um, storage of naloxone, it really wants to be at room temperature. Um, it will freeze, it will overheat. It wants to be at like 50 degrees. Um, and if it, you know, if it's frozen and it thaws, or if you have overheated naloxone, you should go ahead and use it still. Um, it's not going to cause harm, but it's also, you may need to use a little bit more than you normally would. So when in doubt, use any naloxone you have, but certainly try to keep it at room temperature. As far as an expiration date goes, naloxone is effective years and years, like 30 years after its expiration date. Again, over time, it will lose some of its effectiveness, but um, you know we should go ahead and use it. Maybe just use more than we normally would. So I'm going to open it up for questions and conversation. I see that we have some questions here already. Um, so I will address some of those. And then um, and then kind of open it up for conversation. So one question that came in, um, are most overdoses accidental? And I would say yes, you know, um, overdoses because we have an unpredictable supply, because someone's tolerance may change, you know, people experience um, accidental overdoses. And so in that situation, you know, giving naloxone is obviously so important. Um, there are definitely times when someone is experiencing an overdose through um, a suicide attempt, but we know that, you know, that's, that's a different situation. Um, so I would say, yes, most overdoses are accidental. Um, yeah, so is there a phone number that someone can call after they administer naloxone? Um, after the whole episode, or if they need to like get some support and decompress, folks can definitely reach out to us. Um, we have a 24 hour rule. We will always get back in touch or attempt to reach someone within 24 hours of them reaching out for naloxone, safe use supplies or support. Um, it's just important that folks leave the best way to um, contact them. If you don't leave a message, we are not going to call back because of confidentiality. We want our, our program is completely anonymous. Um, so we want to know the best way to reach you. What about kids or teens? Is it still safe to use? Yes. So we want to give naloxone to anyone who we think is experiencing an opioid overdose, regardless of age or size. Other questions? I have a couple of questions. I This is like one of the best trainings I've ever been to because I have an absolutely no baseline knowledge. And so it's just like I have every single thing is new to me and I'm just learning so much. But um, Thank you. Uh, all of the images that I have in my head about overdose are related to intravenous drug use based on movies, I think probably mm -hmm. almost exclusively. And I don't even know if that is how people are overdosing typically mm -hmm. from opioid use because you were mentioning like fentanyl powder and I've heard of fentanyl patches but I, I do not know so I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you could talk about that a little 
And I also would like it if you could talk about um, manslaughter charges if you're the person who has um, provided the drugs that a person has used and then maybe died from an overdose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for asking those questions. So folks can overdose on prescription drugs as well as um, a street-based supply of drugs. So heroin, other opioid analogs, fentanyl, fentanyl analogs. Um, and when we think about risk, so what puts someone at a higher risk for overdose, how you administer those drugs plays into risk. So smoking or eating is safer than injecting because of how the bot, how the drug um, is like absorbed and works within the body. Um, so sometimes when we're looking at safety planning with someone, it really is talking about like how you're using, right? Like um, encouraging someone that, you know, if this is, if they're open to it, to smoking or to eating their drug rather than um, injecting. And that is, you know, testament to the supply that we have, to the risk that is present. Um, and so while you're at a higher risk through injection, kind of baseline, folks are experiencing overdoses who are smoking their drugs or using other means of, of administration. And then manslaughter charges. Um, I'm not sure if, I guess maybe I'm wondering what, what, your, what your question is within that, or if you're just looking for a little explanation of it. Um, I am wondering how, how much people are at risk by doing drugs together, because obviously it's safest if they do it together. Yet, if you are the one who provided the drug to your friend, then you do it together, your friend dies. And then all of a sudden you're on the line for manslaughter charges. That, that's an argument to do it alone as much as possible, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So criminalization and the drug war perpetuates the death of our community. <laughs> and that's like that. And so that's exactly how it is, you know, like in your, in your explanation of that, when we increase criminalization of drug use and the safety practices that individuals use to decrease their risk, when we criminalize those behaviors, there is fear and there is, um, and there are barriers, right? That folks will find that safety, that folks will use alone and that they will die because they are scared to be with their friend um, when they're using. And so I think that that is, you know, one of those, one of the ways, one scenario in which people um, are being impacted and harmed by um, the drug war. I, my yeah so I'm just wondering if there's any way we can combat that besides policy change obviously um mm -hmm. like is there any like knowing your rights that you can deny providing the drug or like is there any is there anything besides policy change that can help yeah so you know I've known folks and this is symbolic right this is a symbolic response who have filled out um statements that say, if I die, I do not want someone charged with my death. Now, whether or not those are respected, I think, I'm sure there are like legal, you know, workarounds 100%, but that is a symbolic, meaningful statement that says, I am, you know, moving within my autonomy and choice to use right now. And I do not some, want someone to be criminally responsible for my death. 
Um, and so I have, you know, I have known um, folks to utilize that response. And then policy change too, right? I mean, I think that that's what's, what is so um, harmful about some of our systems is that it just creates and recreates um, lack of safety for folks. Um, and so, you know, we need policies that are not killing people that are not um, perpetuating harm in that way. Other questions or thoughts? Also just recognizing that we have three minutes, so. A couple of quick ones. Is there any concern or worry? Can needles break, syringes break? Is that a thing? Like- um, In your body? Yeah, or like you're trying to, you're trying to administer naloxone and the, it breaks while you're puncturing through clothing or something, or maybe you're not going at a 90 degree angle, your hand slips, yeah. does that happen? A syringe tip can break, um, but you should, that shouldn't stop you from using it. If that were to happen, you would just let EMS know, but that doesn't happen very often. Yeah, I've always wondered We that. also twist, so like syringes, like the syringe twists on and off. And every time we pack all of the kits that we pack, we twist them to make sure they're tightly on. Um, and so that's just one way that we make sure that it's just like completely ready for someone to use. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. um, and is there one, like, uh, is there a most reliable method or all, all are pretty, pretty reliable? All are totally reliable. And when using nasal, we want somebody to be laid down and imagine gravity, like you shoot the nasal spray up and then it drips out of the nose. Somebody's ideally laying down when you administer nasal. Yeah, so it's actually, you know, so really similar to how we're providing that rescue breathing, which is tipping their chin back. That also, you know, supports the nasal administration, although it does have such a force that it's, you know, it's, it is also, you know, we're doing the best that we can in that moment. And the last question, which I'm just seeing pop into the chat here is if a syringe isn't available, can the injectable be administered any other way? Um, trying to not in this preparation, right? So the other multi-step preparation, it, the multi-step nasal is actually just like in an atomizer screwed into an inoculation, you know? Um, but for this, I, we wouldn't be able to like to draw it out of any other way. Mm -hmm. It's a good question though. If, you know, if you didn't have, yeah, that's, that's my answer to that. All right. Other, I, don't, I don't see anything in the chat and I'm noticing that it's 11. Just want to be conscious of time. Um, my, my last question is where do we get one of the sweet hoodies that you have on? Um, yeah. Well, we're actually, <laughs> you can find our merchandise on our website. Awesome. In which case, and I'm gonna put our information in the, um, in the chat box. <laughs> awesome, thanks Hillary. Yeah. All right, I think I'm gonna stop the recording now since we're sort of all wrapped up here. Thank you very much, everyone.